From KGW, this is The Good Stuff. And tonight on The Good Stuff, we're talking to an inspirational local artist, turning his passion into a powerful tool that's helping him leave a life on the streets. Hey everybody, I'm Brittany Falkers, and thanks so much for joining us. The painter is hoping to not only turn his own life around through his work, but to also change people's assumptions about those who are homeless. Sydney Dorner has our story. You kind of see where you're supposed to go. <laughs> and then you don't question it. After couch surfing and living on the streets throughout the pandemic, Kem decided to move to Portland. Born in Sweden, he says he's been painting and creating colorful murals his entire life. Landed in Portland with the intention of finding an artist residency, uh, creating a space to live and work and finding a home. And it now feels like doing that. Shortly after arriving in the Rose City, he discovered Gather Make Shelter, an organization that helps artists without housing. I actually painted a mural inside the shelter first. One painting and mural at a time, he was able to gain a sense of stability, even commissioned for murals by businesses across the city, like the bakery Gluten Free Gem on Northeast Broadway and 2nd Avenue. And then use that money to buy clothes, <laughs> buy food, and use it as a portfolio examples to be able to take around and basically walk all the quadrants of Portland uh, to find business. He hopes people can let go of the heavy stigma homelessness carries. There's a lot of different ways in. It's not just drug addiction. It's not just mental wellness. There's people out there on the street that just, you know, miss their mortgage and their families can take them in. There are a lot of LGBTQ members out there that have been pushed out by their families that are really talented people, artists. Kem is still facing financial troubles despite securing his apartment that doubles as a studio. He says realizing everything is temporary has kept him focused. And if you'd like to support Kem's artwork or have a mural commissioned, you can find him on Instagram at Kem Made It. That's K-H-E-M Made It. And hey, speaking of social media, I asked you to share the good stuff in your life. And I really love the array of photos you all sent in. So let's start with David's good boy, Gus Gus. Just look at Gus Gus, that pose absolutely melts my heart. That's the kind of good stuff I need on my social news feed. Suzanne shared a pic of her sweet pooches. Oh my goodness, look at these two tuckered out golden babies. Just a couple of babies there. All right, enough of the doggy voice. Now to the kitty voice. Mary's four-legged good stuff is her cat, Gigi, who always brightens her day. Can you actually see her? She's perfectly blending in with the carpet there. Such a good kitty. Anna's furry and scaly family members are her good stuff. Here they are, soaking up some sunshine. I just love this unlikely pair. I feel like there's some like Disney Pixar movie in the making, right? And Gary shared a picture of a great good stuff combo, family and nature. Looks like you have a really fun bunch to get out there with too. Hey, here are a few of the youngest members of Sue's family. She took the grandkids to the Portland Light Festival this weekend. Such a cool event. Looks like the kiddos had fun. Francis takes us to the beach for a good stuff moment on the coast flying kites. I had to say there's something really nostalgic about this photo. I haven't flown a kite in years, but this makes me want to. So thanks for sharing, Francis. Meanwhile, Veronica is sharing the good stuff spirit all the time, making beautiful crochet blankets and gifting them. She made this one for Dean here, an editor for Smoke Signals newspaper. He retired just last month, so she made him this blanket that's black, white, and red all over. Get it? Newspaper? <laughs> I think that's so clever, Veronica. And you are so very talented. Hey, we want you to share your photos and stories of good stuff happening in your community. You can do it by texting us at that familiar number, 503-226-5088, or you can email us at thegoodstuff at kgw.com. Okay, Portland is such a foodie town that we have a whole week dedicated to dumplings. Getting you hungry? This week on KGW News at Sunrise, our Christine Pitowanich, our local foodie, got to talk to some of the participating chefs and try their delicious dumpling options. Get a look at what's to offer at Gato Gato. 
Hey, so this is Dominga Weaver Huff, chef de cuisine from Gato Gato. Yes. Okay, so for people who aren't familiar with Gato yes. Gato, uh, what should they be expecting if and when they decide to come try your dumplings or just decide to come and have some dinner? Yeah, uh, Gato Gato is like uh, Indonesian influenced food with like influences from our head chef Tom's travels throughout China and some of my travels throughout China as well. Uh, but it's kind of like a Chinese Indonesian fusion. I wouldn't oh. call it quite uh, traditional, but it is our version of Indonesian food. Okay, so you've traveled to China too, yes. and when you traveled to China, like what got your attention when you were like looking at their food and thinking about ways to incorporate um, that kind of cuisine into this? Mm -hmm. uh, one of our last trips, we took a trip to Singapore, uh, which Tom's grandma lived in Singapore for a good period of time, so he takes influence from there. We ate around at hawker stations and kind of like the street food just got to experience the food that they eat in Singapore, which is close to Indonesia. Oh, that is yeah. so cool. And so we're talking about dumpling week. Typically, do you do kind of the same special dumpling for mm -hmm. each year of dumpling week? I mean, now this year, it marks 10 years that dumpling week has been going on. Or do you do a new dumpling every single time? Yeah, uh, for dumpling week, we try to do a new dumpling every year, something that's new and exciting that gets our creative juices flowing. Oh. Uh, but we do have dumplings that are staying on the menu that don't leave. We have a shumai dumpling with like a spicy mustard and some chives, and that's been on the menu uh, since our first dumpling week. Wow, okay. Drew Carney. Yes, yes, yes. It is what your turn. Okay, so no. let's plate up like a little dumpling for him. Yeah. We are talking dumpling week, Drew. Typically, do you like dumplings? Yes. Okay. And what do you like so much about dumplings, Drew? When you're eating a dumpling, what do you love? You no, know, typically, them? I find that the food I love most food is that is food that I can pick up with my fingers. Now I know typically yeah. I can't do that with a dumpling. Uh -huh. I'm going to need some kind of utensil. Totally. So it goes beyond that with me. Yep. Uh, I do like the fact <laughs> that I can still take a dumpling and shove the whole thing in my mouth and savor that entire bite all at once. Absolutely. Yes. And I feel like you can May do I? it here. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And while he's eating this mm -hmm. dumpling, can you tell us what's in it? Yes, it is a chicken and shrimp wonton. It is sitting in a ginger turmeric uh, <laughs> I wanted to get rid of the vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> it's sitting in a ginger turmeric uh, chicken broth. There's mm -hmm. a aromatic chili schmaltz, like a chicken chili oil, uh, some pickled gai choy, oh some crispy chicken skins, and uh, you'll see some pea tendrils on the top. Just you know where it's sitting right now? Mm. Yep. It's sitting in my belly. Ooh, how's, it, how's, it, how's it taste, though? It's amazing. All <laughs> those flavors are just screaming in my mouth right now. There's like definitely a kick to it, which definitely. I love. And you know what I noticed? They're so tender. I don't really need to chew. Oh, I hope you did chew, Drew. We don't want you to choke. <laughs> Dumpling Week is put on by the Oregonian. They've got a full list of participating restaurants. You can check it out at dumplingweek.com. Mm, so yummy. Next here on The Good Stuff, breaking the stigma of mental health in the black community. You know what? Mental health is a human experience. It is a human experience. We all have it. A local doctor talks about how to start the conversation that you may have never had before.
a familiar furry face asked a seemingly simple question on social media and we answered. Sesame Street's Elmo checking in to ask how everybody's doing. It's a tweet that was met with an outpouring of exhausted responses. Now, this week's Healthier Together isn't all about Elmo, but it is about what he started, a conversation, and the obvious need for us to have a caring, understanding ear when talking about mental health. Why is it so hard to talk about? Number one, we don't talk about it. And number two, the way that we talk about it. That's what makes it hard. Dr. Keith Dempsey is a clinician, speaker, and community advocate. Anytime you don't talk about something, no matter what it is, it gives it a kind of stigma. Um, it makes it taboo. So whatever that thing is, really what that says is, whatever that thing is, it's not okay to talk about. There's something wrong with that thing. And historically, when we talk about mental health, the way we approach it has been negative. We talk about it like if you're dealing with mental health, something is wrong with you. So now that I've been you know, going around the country for this past year talking about this stuff, I just say, you know what? Mental health is a human experience. It is a human experience. We all have it. February 1st is Time to Talk Day, a growing movement to encourage everyone to start a conversation about mental health. It can be as simple as checking in. How are you doing? And Dr. Dempsey says the most important thing that you can do for others is listen. And it, it doesn't have to go any further than that. Hey, I'm here to talk. I'm here to listen. You know, I'm not trying to judge. I don't have answers for you, but I notice, you know, that, you know, things have been a little hard for you, but I'm here. Now, the challenges with starting the conversation and accessing care are unique to everyone. And Dr. Dempsey is trying to address that in the black community. There's a lot of stick, but there's like, we don't go to counseling. We go to church. Uh, what goes on in this home stays in this home. So there's a big push. There's everybody says, you know, black folks, we have got to get past this stigma. That's correct. However, it's incumbent upon us to understand where that stigma came from. There's a history in the medical systems, there's a history in the mental health systems that African American folks have not been treated well. So when you haven't been treated well and you haven't been, you haven't gotten good outcomes, um, you are in a place that's not safe, you stay away from those places. So. The first thing is to understand that the stigma comes from somewhere. And that's why it's so important to talk about it within our families, our friendships, and our communities to build trust, break stigmas, and foster better mental well being. And in the next Healthier Together, Dr. Dempsey goes deeper into the barriers black communities face when talking about mental health and access to the right care. For more resources, you can go to kgw.com slash healthier together. And a big reminder here, if you or someone you know is in crisis, help is available 24 seven by calling or texting that number right there on your screen, 988. Still to come, all this month we're featuring black Americans with ties to the Northwest who've broken barriers. Next, the amazing life of Margaret Carter, the first black woman ever elected to Oregon's legislature.
Welcome back. All month long, in honor of Black History Month, we're highlighting influential black Americans with ties to Oregon and Southwest Washington. And today, we're talking about a local politician with a long list of firsts. Ashley Grahams has a look at Margaret Carter's incredible career of public service. Margaret Louise Carter was born in Shreveport, Louisiana in 1935. Her journey to Oregon came in 1967, when she left Louisiana to get out of an abusive relationship. With just $100 and her five kids, she arrived in the Rose City. While in Oregon, Carter earned a master's degree from Oregon State University and worked for 27 years as a counselor and faculty member at Portland Community College. In 1983, a bipartisan group convinced Carter to run for office. She won and became the first black woman elected to the Oregon legislature, serving for 26 years. During that time in office, Carter became the first black woman to co-chair the powerful Ways and Means Budget Writing Committee. She also passed a bill declaring Martin Luther King Jr. Day an official holiday. Carter also lent her skills to various other organizations, leading the National Organization of Black Elected Legislative Women and the Urban League of Portland. She would eventually retire from public service in 2014. This list of honors is long. In 2010, OSU honored Carter with the Alumni Fellow Award. And the next year, PCC named their new technology building after her. And in retirement, Carter isn't slowing down. She still serves on three different boards, in addition to mentoring youth. Good stuff. We are all about positivity, but this news is bittersweet. 
Today is my last day here at KGW, and this right here is my very last show. I'm staying in Portland, but I'm leaving the TV news industry. Trust me, it was not an easy decision, but I'm super excited for the next chapter and challenges ahead. A big thank you to everyone who has helped me grow over my past 12 years in local news and to everyone who has trusted me to tell their story. I've gotten to meet some amazing people over the years, so I wanted to share a few stories that just really stuck with me over my time here at KGW, including this feature on two groups dedicated to helping teens who are aging out of the foster care system. Local nonprofit New Narrative teamed up with a program called Ascending Flow. They empower youth and young adults by pairing them up with mentors and helping them develop self-expression skills. Those who'd been through the program were a testament to just how important their work is. I was not doing well in school. I was a troublemaker. I had a lot of anger issues. I was depressed, suicidal. But as the process of coming in here every week, it's definitely helped me. Doing my music, it's allowed me to express myself in a different way. I've also been very lucky to speak with local doctors and patients on the cutting edge of some truly inspiring medical procedures, and that includes a brain surgery with no cutting involved. Neurosurgeons at OHSU were able to treat a woman's essential tremor, which creates severe shaking, usually in the hands, that makes daily diff tasks difficult. And for Carolyn here, a professional artist, it was especially hard. Through the procedure, doctors fo used a focused ultrasound to burn a circuit of the brain and correct the tremor. I gotta tell you, I'm never gonna forget the moment in the recovery room when she saw the tremor that had afflicted her for more than three decades nearly vanish. Oh my goodness. There are little things that I haven't been able to do that I probably couldn't even tell you until all of a sudden I'll be able to do them again. They just burn a little bit and then it, I have my hand back. Gosh, Carolyn is just an amazing person and such a lovely woman who let me share her story. And that's really just a snippet of the stories that I'm so proud to have told during my career. I know how local news can really feel like it's all doom and gloom. And yeah, that can be true. We're dealing with some really hard realities every single day. But that's why this show, The Good Stuff, has been so important to me personally. It's easier for me to get through all of that doom and gloom that is the reality, knowing that at the end of my shift, I get to share the good stuff with my community. So just a really big thank you to first our executive producer, Allison Rogers. I'm going to start tearing up because she's not just brilliant. Um, she's a best friend and I couldn't ask for a better person to help guide me and go on this good stuff journey with me. She makes this job so much fun and I'm going to miss her so much. Um, she lets me be me, which is kind of a lot sometimes. And a big thank you to all of you at home just for being part of this show and letting me come into your living rooms or wherever you're watching every single night to celebrate the good stuff when we can find it because it's out there. We've proven that and we need that in our lives together. It brings us closer together. So as for what's next, well, I'm joining Jordan Schnitzer and his team at Schnitzer Properties as the director of communication, where I know I'm going to be able to continue to make a positive impact in our community. So oh, thank you all so much for letting me have this responsibility of local TV news over the past 12 years and for five years here at KGW. I appreciate all of you at KGW in this local market and all of you viewers at home. I also appreciate all the love that you've shown me on social media as well. So for one final time, I want to say thanks for taking a little time for the good stuff.